right, well, we're getting settled. Welcome, everybody. See a lot of familiar fa faces. Karen Davis, thanks for hanging in there with us. Good to see you again. Got so many, I have to lean over and, uh, and change my pages here. This is exciting. Hello. And my friend Carolyn from uh, from Helena has joined us again. Thank you for uh, for popping in, Carolyn. Hey, dog. Hey, hey. <clears throat> Janet Brandt. I think Janet's made all of these. Uh, maybe maybe missed only one, but um, but definitely getting gold stars there. I am. I I. I have to admit I'm a little fanboyish here today because I have been a fan of our guest author for a long, long time. And so it's uh, if I get a little verklempt, um, uh, please excuse my tongue tiredness, but um, this is a really incredible opportunity um, for me to spend a little bit more time with someone I've come to know a little bit and, and come to respect greatly. Um, and so I'm just delighted that we're gonna be able to share a little bit of time uh, we have enough people joining us that we'll we'll wait another minute or two as we add people through the wait, waiting room uh, to to our group. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't looked ahead, the next book is The Wonder of Birds by uh, Montana resident New York Times writer Jim Robbins. Jim's an amazing guy, um, really involved in in the community in Helena. Uh, his his wife, um, Cher Dusto, is in charge of the Montana Historic Preservation Group, and we work closely with uh, with Cher on this very chalet. And I really look forward to diving into Jim's book. Um, he, he, this is a newer book for him. Uh, he's got an, a number of other books. He's a really smart, uh, capable, thoughtful uh, person. I think people will enjoy uh, getting to know a little bit. So. Um, so that's up for, for next month um, and registration for that. I think Jill will open that in the morning. Does that sound right? Is that open now? Yes, everyone should get an email tomorrow with the recording for this session and then a link to the registration for Wonder of Birds as well. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. And then we're going to close out the year um, with our dear friend George Bristol's uh, wonderful book, um, kind of about the about kind of the legends of, of Glacier and the giants of the park. So uh, that's going to be a fun way to do it. And we'll be back at it. We'll have a full slate and we'll be announcing that soon for 2021. So um, lots to look forward to here uh, in the book club and other uh, online events, virtual events here at the Conservancy. Um, I'm Doug Mitchell and I get the privilege of working with the best team in the business here uh, at the Glacier National Park Conservancy. And it's just a delight to be able to uh, to spend our time working to help protect the park and, and what all of you do is what makes that happen. So thank you for your support, for caring about this special place. As I often say, we, we are uh, here to protect one of America's greatest natural treasures. And, um, you know, Christine and I were talking a little bit earlier. Um, you know, my wife grew up here and actually has known uh, Christine and, and her family uh, for a long, long time. So for Julie and I to be able to give back to the park in this way late in our career is, uh, is really a cool way to um, to be able to participate, but it wouldn't be possible without all of you. So thank you very much. Um, so I think we've got, a, we've got our group gathered, so I'll go ahead and watch. Um, uh, tonight we um, just have a really distinct pleasure. It's our first fiction book, uh, and it's uh, a book that I got to know in 2015. Is that right, Christine? Yeah, that's when it came out. Uh, and I was uh, I was writing book reviews for the Montana Magazine, and um, I came upon this new book by a Montana writer, and um, I read it in a weekend. Christine will ruin your weekends, just FYI, um, because <laughs> you can't put these things down. Um, and uh, I was bold enough to ask if I might do an author interview with her, and I think we were able to post that. Um, and she was, of course, super gracious. And, and so um, I was able to do an interview with her and also do a review for Montana Magazine. And that's how I came to know this extraordinary um, author who um, you know, has, has been around the world, studied in Norway, went to, I think, PLU in Tacoma, if I'm not mistaken, um, has a master's in English from 
uh, the University of Montana has taught English at Flathead Valley Community College and um, is, is really um, an important part of our Glacier community. Um, Christine and her husband and family have been um, super supportive, um, as you can read in her books, where she regularly not only um, thanks the Conservancy for our work, um, but also um, in one of the books, and I'll, I'll give extra prizes to anyone who knows the answer, um, actually gave a shout out to our backpackers ball uh, in one of her books. So thank you for that. So uh, Christine Carbo, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. This is so awesome. I, this is this is an honor for me to join you. Well, it's 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 super fun. You know, you and I had a chance to chat a, a little bit earlier, and I thought I would start by kind of talking about your path from growing up as a I think you came as an eighth grader, growing up here in the Flathead to spending some time away in various places, coming back to the Flathead, and how that journey informed your writing in terms of uh, perspective of place? Sure. So um, you're right. I was born actually in the same place that my main character in The Wild Inside, Ted, um, comes from, from Gainesville, Florida. I was born there. And my father, similar to Ted's father, um, was work working for... Um, the University of Florida as the chief of neuropathology there. And he wanted to just move. He had a great job there at the University of Florida and said, you know what, I'd love to move to Montana. So he and my mom both decided that they wanted to go to the mountains. So they moved us up here and I was in eighth grade. And um, it was, gosh, sorry about that. I'm not sure if that's. I think that's, I think that's perfect. Is, is that coming through on you? I'm sorry, a phone call just came through on my computer and I didn't. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, sorry. No, no a Zoom call yeah. wouldn't be complete without, you know, a dog bark, an ambulance, a phone call. Yeah, yeah. next time that happens, I'll have just to. Check that off. We, yeah. We did it. Um, so the, the move here was right at a critical age for me. I mean, I was in eighth grade and so I wasn't sure what to make of it because it's like a part of me wanted to hate Montana because it's like, where, where's this awful place that you moved me to? It was January. It was one of the coldest winters ever. And in fact, um, for those of you that know the area, it was completely frozen, which is unusual that winter from, um, Lakeside and Summers Bay and that whole area over to Big Fork. That whole bay was completely frozen and it's usually not frozen all the way across because Flathead Lake is so deep. And so it, it, it was frozen that year and it was just a very, very cold year. And we moved in January, like I said, and I was kind of a little bit in shock because I was leaving the beaches, my friends in Florida and coming to Montana and, um, I think I was kind of a bratty teenager with my parents. I think I even said, Montana sucks a couple times to them. And, you know, and they were just like, oh, you'll learn to love it. And they were right. I ended up loving it by that summer. And then as time went on, you know, I finished high school and I went off to college and did different things and tried different jobs in different places. And I was even a flight attendant for a while and uh, lived in Dallas. And then I lived in Salt Lake City where I was based. And I flew around, part of that was to travel. Part of it was just trying to get a job with a communication arts major, <laughs> which, was a, which was tough. And, um, and so, you know, I was taking whatever I could get and a flight and Delta was hiring. So I did that and I did some other things. And, um, when I decided that I wanted to go back to graduate school for English, because that's kind of where my heart, uh, you know, I just was really drawn to that, you know, drawn to books, drawn to writing, drawn to language also in general, and um, wanted to study linguistics. So I went back and I got my master's in English and linguistics at the University of Montana. And when I came back here and ended up in Montana, I had this whole new appreciation for it that wasn't I, you know, I learned to love it as a teen after my parents moved me here, but it wasn't, it wasn't the same as learning to love it as a young adult, like on my own, my own choice to be in the state and to be in the North, 
west part of the state near Glacier Park from the in the Flathead Valley where I had you know moved to as a teenager or as a young te very young teenager as an adolescent so I um you know that was that was just once I got here I was like I don't want to leave and so you know I went and I got my master's in Missoula and then I got a job at um, FBCC at Flathead Valley Community College as an adjunct uh, teaching for not a lot of pay, I have to say. Adjunct people don't make very much money and no benefits. And one time I calculated my hours out and I would think I was making about two, 210 an hour teaching four classes with lots of essays and lots of lesson plans and lots, you know, lots of work to do. And, and I was not, you know, just not making very much money. But the thing was, is I loved it and I loved living here. And so I made it work and, um, and, and, you know, that really, that alone didn't inform my writing until much later. But what I did when I was working at the college in my twenties, I wrote two novels, two non-genre novels that I've never done anything with. They were just in, in a way they were almost practice novels for me. But back then, you know, the Oprah book club was really huge and that's what I wanted was this really kind of slice of life, drama, kind of um, very literary book. That's, that's what I had dreams of doing at that point. And, um, and I think they were pretty bad, honestly. <laughs> but I mean, I never really did anything with them, so I don't know how bad they were, but they were, they were my entry into the field. And then after the second, the first one took me four years to write. And then the second one took two years to write. So um, the first one took a long time. And then by the second one, I kind of cut that time in half. But the thing was by the second one, I ended up going through a divorce and that completely put me into a different kind of um, realm and kind of a survival mode really. And making the money I made as an adjunct wasn't working anymore. So I ended up um, picking up a lot of extra work as um, a technical writer. And by the end of the day, I was so exhausted from being on the computer so much and from grading essays and being on the computer all the time that I ended up not being able to write creatively. And I did that for about 10 years. So for over, a, I put those two novels aside and said, this isn't for me. I'm just, you know, I'm a single mom now and I'm just gonna do this, this make, make money thing, which is what I needed to do. So after about 10 years, and I remarried and we combined families and things started feeling a little more secure for me, I was um, able to put aside some of the technical writing and I ended up opening a Pilates studio. And that's a whole other story for how I got into that. But I opened a Pilates studio and when I did that, I, and I wasn't at the computer all the time doing technical writing, which no offense if anybody out there does it, but for me it was a little bit mono monotonous. And when I quit doing that, this whole, and I'd quit working at the college as well, just so I could run this Pilates business that was, you know, that was working and I was having fun with it. It was, it wasn't the same kind of instruction I was used to at, you know, at, at, at the college level with the critical thinking kinds of instruction and the literature, but it was, it was fun. It was teaching people about the mind body connection and just, you know, just how to move properly and how to find the right balance with, with, their musculature. And, um, and so I, ha so in a weird way and no pun intended, but it, it gave me the flexibility to get back to the creative writing. And so well into my forties, that's when I jumped back into the creative writing. And at that point I decided I would write what I love to read and that was mysteries. And so at that point to get a really long answer to your question, Doug, but at that point, the park really then that's when it struck me that not only do I want to write what I love to read, which is suspense and mysteries, but I want to write about this place that is so special to me that I love and that I've been able to enjoy, divorce or not, you know, all these years as I've been, you know, after I moved back to the flathead, after I quit being a flight attendant. And so that, that is, um, is just huge to me in my writing. I mean, I don't know if I'm gonna always write stories that are set in, you know, in and around Glacier Park, but I probably will always write setting 
that has to do with with the great outdoors in some way or another because it to me it's so powerful how our place shapes us as people and so that plays into developing character for me how place develop characters and um i the mysteries i love are steeped in a really strong sense of place and really inform who the characters are and so that's what my goal was that was what my aim was you know and and with the wild inside i had to decide what is ted's relationship to this place and i didn't want it to be the same relationship i have with glacier because i i love glacier i adore glacier i it, glacier doesn't haunt me it but it i just i made the conscious choice that glacier would be almost an antagonist to ted that it would it would, it would, in a way, bug him, feel like he, it was preventing him from doing his job because he had these horrible memories from seeing his father get attacked there. Yeah, super interesting. You know, what a great, thank you for um, that answer and for sharing so openly with us about your, about your background and, and how you got to this point. Uh, because I think, you know, I, I think you're exactly right. This idea of of writing to place. I mean, I, I, you know, I would open it up. We're already getting questions in the chat and please do use the chat Yay. to ask questions. You can also just blurt it out as well, but um, we have everybody muted at this point. So if you don't hear yourself, um, we can help with that. Um, but please do use the chat and we'll be get, we'll get to those as well. But I, um, I asked in, in a, the discussion points that I sent out prior to the event, about to, to book club members, I'd love for somebody to kind of help us think through this. Um, as I think about other authors that share that same thing, I think of people like C.J. Box or or um, James Lee Burke, something like that, where you have a, you have a suspense story, but you also have this really strong feeling of of sense of place. So, so I would other people when you read Christine's work about what other fiction writers does it remind you? Someone has to answer. We can be really quiet. <laughs> or if you're shy, you're... you can leave your answer in the chat. Yeah. I was thinking about Nevada Bar, who I love because I like to do the national parks as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, she's great. And I, I, this is my first book club, and it's only because I just went to Glacier in July, and then I saw your book, and I was a forensic science teacher for a very long time. And so I love a good murder mystery. I just have to say, <laughs> and so, and I got to admit, I'm not quite done yet. So don't anybody tell the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it. We'll keep it a secret, or or we'll or we'll mute all. Every, we'll figure something out. I, my favorite okay. thing so far is that whole imagery I got when he Ted goes to the bear locked in the cage with the red lights on. I mean. I was reading that in the bed and I thought, I'm never going to get to sleep. <laughs> I was just like in the, you know, in the moment with him. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I should get your name or your number because I always have questions about forensics. forensics yeah. My students used to ask me, are you teaching us how to get away with <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm not telling you all of it. <laughs> Well, we can we can hook you two guys up uh, after the book club. I'm sure Emily can uh, can crack that code for us and, Absolutely. and work on that. Any other offers about uh, authors that you you felt connected to when you read when you read Christine's book? So I think we um, I think we have some other questions in the chat, Jill. We do, yeah. And as we were asking about authors, um, we didn't get any author mentions in the chat, but we did get a few comments just about um, praise for Christine. You're writing about the outdoors and how that resonates with them. So there's there's some reflection about the outdoors and um, how you did an awesome job of incorporating nature and science and biology. So there's some comments about that, which is really cool. Um, we did get a question from Mary about grizzly attacks in two of your novels. And she asked, um, well, she commented, you added such drama with those two events. Um, what do you think of the danger from grizzlies now? Well, um, I think that just as it was then, the, the danger 
from Grizzlies is very small. I mean, you know, it's always been relatively small. Um, the idea that somebody gets mauled by a grizzly bear, but unfortunately, you know, the areas that wild animals have are shrinking as more and more lands get developed in the West and in the Northwest. And so, you know, there's, there's chances. And so you have to be smart and you have to bring your bear spray, um, and you have to make noise and hike with a buddy or in a group of people. And, you know, you just have to be smart about things and they want to avoid you just as much as you want to avoid them. And so I don't think it's anything to, to be afraid of. Um, I think it's something to be aware of when you're hiking in glacier country, but I don't, you know, I don't, and even the Bob Marshall or other places around, I, you know, I walk my dogs, often up in the whitefish range and I just carry bear spray just to be on the safe side, you know, and I'm not super worried about running into grizzly bears, although there are, there are some up there, but I'm, and I'm, and I know that black, I see more black bears and I'm not worried about them necessarily either. Often they, they run when they notice that I'm around and, and, but you know, you, there, you can get yourself into a bad situation if you get between a, mother and her cubs or surprise one of them. And um, so it's good to have your, your capsaicin with you and, and, and be prepared. Um, but as far as more grizzly attacks than there were back in 2015 when I wrote that, um, I don't think there's any more, I don't think it's more frequent, maybe a little, but only because there's more people. Um, but you know, Doug, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's been great uh, moves forward since Night of the Grizzlies, right? Where, where the park really changed its entire approach right. to how to handle um, animals and, and waste and, you know, th those kinds of things. So I think there's been a really positive sea change in terms of protecting both the animal and, and the human. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we really haven't had a fatality bear attack other than that very random bike event with the with the with the forest ranger um, and the grizzly, um, you know, a couple of years ago, whenever that was. Um, and I think a lot of it, to your point, Christine, is exactly right. Just people are more aware to be cautious. It's in all the publications. Um, it, it it there's a lot of access to that information. I don't think the internet hurts in that realm, right? We have a page on our site that says, "What do I need when I hike?" Um, and you can get that information much more readily. So um, I think people are pretty, pretty respectful about that for sure. Yeah. We're prob probably not going to get tied to a tree is my, my guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, obviously I was writing, you know, fiction for sure and dramatizing and trying to create suspense and taking all the liberties that go with that but you know i did learn about the difference between a conditioned bear and a bear that is um you know there's all these categories for the bears that that the bear committees in glacier take and in all the national parks that have bears take very seriously so that they can try and protect both humans and bears mm -hmm. we're getting some comments um carolyn commented she just watched a documentary on Night of the Grizzlies on YouTube. Um, M. Hall, my dog was killed by a black bear this last year. So sorry to hear that. But they mentioned your story resonated with me in terms of Ted's feelings about nature and how he finally reconciled the fierceness or unforgivingness of nature, which is natural with that of humans. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting comment. Nice. Um, Thank you. We're also getting a few questions just about some characters, Christine. Um, let's see, Eric uh, had a question. Did you know ahead of time that Monty, not Ted, would be the returning character? No, I did not. Um, where do I start with that? I wrote The Wild Inside, you know, I had come back to writing, like I told you, after about a 10 year break. And when I came back to it and decided, I was very deliberate about it. I was like, I'm gonna write what I love to read and I'm going to 
by golly, I'm going to get this published. Like I was driven. I was like, because it's really hard to get a book published in the, in, in the traditional sense of publishing. I mean, there's all sorts of other avenues for writers these days, which is great, which is awesome. You know, you can self-publish on Amazon. You can, there's a lot of small presses out. There's presses in Montana that, you, that are really quality presses that you can publish with. Um, but, you know, to get through the pearly gates of New York, um, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily better than, it's just, you know, just different. And it's just something that I was, a dream of mine that I, that, you know, that I wanted to get published that particular way, because that's the way that I grew up understanding that publishing worked. that, you know, that you had to go through New York and you had to go through the big five publishing companies. And so when, when I said about this, I was really just like determined, like, this is, I'm going to get one book on the shelf out there. And, um, so when I sold The Wild Inside and I actually went out to New York and I got an agent and I, and she sold, she got a couple offers from Simon and Schuster and Harper Collins. And I went out to New York and we met at this French cafe and I met one of the, the first editor there from Simon and Schuster. And she said that she loved the bear in The Wild Inside so much. She just, she just thought this bear was just so dramatic and beautiful. And she, she, was, she fell in love with the, with the grizzly bear. So she says to me while we're sitting there, what kind of animal are you going to have in your next book? And all I could think of is I haven't thought of a next book. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I got this one book and I want to get it on the shelf. I'm not thinking about other books, but you clearly that's not the right answer when you, you know, you're meeting with an editor and nobody, my agent didn't, I'm, no offense to her. She probably thought I knew, but I didn't know that I was supposed to come prepared with ideas for other books. And so I just was sitting there saying, well, and the first thing that came to my mind was a Wolverine. And so I said, a Wolverine. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, I don't really want to write books that, you know, the first book with a grizzly on the cover and the second book with a Wolverine and its teeth on the cover. That's like, wasn't the kind of vibe that I wanted to put out there. I, you know, I mean, we've all, most, most of us Montana people will go to a grocery store and we see on the rack, you know, the, the, our, we love the, I love those books, but all the books with the bloody teeth and the claws and, you know, and I was like, oh, that's not really what I'm trying to go for here. I'm trying to go more for like, like you said, Doug, with the James Lee Burke, you know, the, the mysterious subtleties and um, of setting and mystery and atmosphere. And so I, um, so I'd thrown that out about the Wolverine and I ended up going with that publishing company. And of course I didn't, in my second book, it's called Mortal Fall. It involves the death of a Wolverine biologist or a wildlife biologist who is, works with the Wolverine project that takes place in Glacier National Park that, and some of you said you're here for the first time, but if those of you um, were with um, Doug Chadwick's talk last time around, then you know lots about the Wolverine. And it's a fascinating book. And um, I love that book, which is probably the reason I even said the Wolverine in the first place when I was out in New York is because it's the first animal that popped into my mind because they're such amazing little creatures. And so, but I obviously, I didn't want to try and create what I created with the wild inside with another animal. So instead I had a character who studied this animal and I was able to do a little bit of um, informing in Mortal Fall about the Wolverine, not to the level of course of the Wolverine way, not, nothing even close to that, but you know, just drop information about the Wolverine in the same way that I dropped some information about the grizzly bear in the wild inside. And so that, that, um, when I, when I did that, I decided that I really needed to leave Ted because I'd already played through his entire character arc. And so what I did is I took a formula that is, has been used before. And um, the first person that, one of the writers that came to my mind who uses that is uh, Tana French, who writes um, the Dublin murder mystery series. And she, plucks side characters and brings them forward into her next novel. So I thought, well, she can do that. I can do that. So I decided I would pluck Monty because I kind of like Monty and um, bring him forward and show a different side of him because Ted kind of viewed him through his lens, 
but I wanted Monty to kind of shine in his own way and not just be the character that Ted saw, that you saw through Ted's eyes. And so when I, when I developed Monty, it was so fun because he got to come to life in his own way. But it all, you know, it's all a result of, of me saying uh, the Wolverine <laughs> to, to this uh-huh. editor, like, okay, I guess. It, and it just made sense that I would have, if there was going to be a second murder in Glacier Park, that I would have somebody who was already there and not have mm-hmm. Ted come in and, uh, and do that again. So mm-hmm. cool. And kind of going off that, we had another question um, about your writing process. So as you were working your way through the sequels, did your process change at all through the novels as you went along? So yeah, yes and no. I mean, I'm a fairly disorganized person. And so <laughs> I've never had great specific outlines. I'm, I kind of right as far as the headlights and um you know like like uh, el doctoral says you can make it from you can make it to your destination you know at night without exactly knowing all where you're going as long as you've got those headlights and so that's sort of the way i write i write as far as i can see for the moment in my story and then i i sort of envision where the end might be so that i, I know where my road is going to end up. I just don't know all the ways that I'm going to get there. And so with The Wild Inside, I knew who the murderer was. With Mortal Fall, I also knew who I wanted to be the murderer. And, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. So I only wrote as far as the headlights with that one. With my third book, I didn't know. It's a, it, there's an abduction of a child in my third book. It's called The Weight of Night. And I did not know who did that, probably for half the book. So I was still writing by the seat of my pants on that one as well. And then um, the fourth book was the same way. I didn't figure out the murder through quite, uh, probably half of it. And so I would say that my writing process changed in terms of not knowing my destination. In fact, I got almost less organized, if that makes sense. Because in the first two books, I wrote as far as the headlights, but I knew where my destination was. I knew I was going to go to California, let's say. And, you know, I knew I was going to, I just didn't know what roads I was going to take. With my last two books, I didn't even know where, if I was going to go to California or New York. I just just wrote the mystery without knowing who com- who committed the crimes. So my process was pretty messy for those two but um, I'm, I want to change that because I think it would be good to have an outline. So, yeah. I'm In addition on, to I'm working on changing it, I'm working on changing my process. <laughs> hey, whatever works, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, in addition to some of the questions about characters, we're also getting some comments about um, some of these locations and local references uh, you make in your books. And Marianne asked if Outlaw's Nest is Packer's Roost. She loved all of the local references. Yeah, so I try and keep those that to myself a little bit because, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, that one's a... <laughs> I'll have to answer yes on that one. That was Packer's Roost. <laughs> but I, I try and make up names for a lot of places because I just don't, you know, I don't want to offend businesses and I don't want to um, have any liability with, you know, not maybe getting permission to use a place or, I mean, Glacier's different. It's public land and, you know, landmarks are different and wilderness is different mat you know cities and you know institutions those are those are all free you know you those are free for all if it's all to use but when you deal with a private establishment it's i know when when you write a memoir you really have to be careful you really have to get permission from everybody you don't have to be as careful with fiction but it, it can be problematic um but then again a lot of fiction writers use you know, they use, estab- you know, private stash establishments all the time in places like New York and LA. And so 
it's, it, you know, it, it can go either way. I was just, I just tried to play it safe, especially since it's such a small area around here and, and people can figure things out like, oh, you know, like you just did, like that was Packer's Roost. But by the same token, sometimes I've picked a place, I've described a place and people think it's some place that they know and it's actually not. Like I have a different place in mind, so. It's really interesting to, to, um, to be gathered like this because as I look at the tiles, I know where a lot of people are from and we have people from all over the country and it's kind of fun to, to all know the Packers roost, right? To, to think about the fact that people from Kansas, North Carolina, Los Angeles are all in this meeting and we're all can nod our heads and know exactly where, where Packers roost is. Um, I, I also, um, my friend from North Carolina, Ed Wilson, is, is hiding under Maria tonight, uh, the name Maria. We'll get into that later. But he raised a question that, that I really was taken with kind of in, in all of your books, which is you do, you, you talk about people at the margins, people who, um, you know, may have some sort of an addiction or some sort of an issue. And, and you do it so, um, you know, t talk a little bit about your choice to put people in the margins in the book and to, to, to make them so human. Did I get that right, Maria? <laughs> Thanks for the question, Maria. Um, yeah, I, okay, so, th and thank you for being so gracious in that, uh, the way you phrased that question, because I have been to book clubs where people are a little upset with me for, for doing that. And, um, you know, why, why do you portray this area to be that way? Or why, um, you know, why do you make it seem like quorum is, is that way? And my answer usually is I'm not really trying to make that area be something, you know, that's, that's not beautiful or, or good. It's, it, it, it's really that I'm writing about crime. I mean, I'm writing suspense and mystery. And when you write about crime, you're naturally going to, in, you're, if, if, you're, if you're following an investigator around, they're naturally going to go to the places where crime occurs. And places where crime occurs have those seedier elements often, not always. I mean, you know, you can, you can definitely have white collar crime and that's a different kind of story. But, um, for me, it, it, there, it, it was twofold. One is that, what, like I said, I was, that I'm, since I'm writing crime, it naturally led me there. But the second thing is that it really does exist in areas that are depressed economically. And we have that. You know, we have that in Montana. And we have a lot of meth. And we have a lot of opioid addiction. And we have a lot of problems that come from groups of, you know, communities that are depressed, that don't have the, the means to, you know, to, to stay busy with, with different kinds of work. And so, um, so that kind of was, so it's, yeah, it's twofold. One of it's just the fiction idea of it, that, you know, that that's where it took me naturally. And some of it was also just that that is, that's real. That's reality for some of those places that are up, up we locals for, you know, most of you know that call it up the line. That's what we call the Canyon from here up to Glacier. And, you know, I've been here since 1978 and that's what we've always called it is, is the line up the line. And we all knew that if nothing good was going to happen when you went up the line. <laughs> or at Taco Bell after two o'clock in the morning. Same <laughs> Yeah, I think this is really interesting. So I had a, another one of my questions, um, and don't make me call you out, Nora Gray, directly. Um, but um, so we have these two characters. We have Monty and Ted, right? So which one of these do you want to have over for dinner or go to go on a hike with? <laughs> or see, come back in, in another book. I know my answer, but I want to hear your, your answers. <laughs> Paul says both. Paul also, by the way, wants to know what happened to Heather. Okay. 
I can circle back to that, but. I like Ted. Really? Gonna, yeah, I, he's just more interesting to me as a, I mean, you developed his character more. I don't know that I liked him, but I liked, he, he had a little, he just had, there was more about him. So it was easy to, I could see different directions with him. Well, that's nice to hear. Cause the last time I did a book club with some women out in Wisconsin and um, one of the ladies told me that she really did not like Ted, that she just didn't like him at all. And I can see that. I mean, I wrote him as a character that was a little, a little flawed, a little broken, a little, um, you know, you know, he, he was a little broken. And so I could see how, and he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder when he got to Glacier, like I said. So, um, I could see where that would rub some people wrong, but I also feel like I did develop him very, very fully. And so I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad you sense that and like that. Thank you. Yeah, good job. So I'm gonna encourage everybody, if you've not, and it's funny, because so how many, just raise your hand, how many of you have skipped ahead and already read more than one of these? Thank you, Kelsey, for being honest. Okay, very good, Lauren, can you repeat, excellent. Can you repeat the question? Um, how many of you have have already skipped ahead and read more than one of these? I love it. Um, I, I highly encourage it, but again, I've had to, to email Christine on two of the last four weekends saying, can you please give me my weekends back because I can't put these books down. <laughs> and my brother's exactly the same way. He called me today. He's like, well, I'm on the third one and I don't can, can go back to work. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's um, so great to hear. But, because I think you, you see that char character development. We've already, we've already let people know that Monty's coming back. Um, in a more detailed level. And I think we find also then that he's flawed too, but in, and in, in, um, uh, I forget some, somebody I was just reading in the chat said kind of my view, which is, you know, both the Susan King said, uh, both of them for different reasons, right? And that Monty's kind of this g gentle guy, also flawed, but Ted, Ted has this real kind of true blue streak to him. Um, very, very interesting. Um, uh, and I, and I really, that, that's one of the things for me. And I wrote this in my review, your ability to develop those characters, um, in a way that's super authentic is really, um, uh, really, uh, incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me to hear that. I, um, you know, Monty was f fun for me because he, he loves, the park that's his you know he was so opposite of ted that in that particular realm you know in that regard you know the the wilderness and the park was his sanity whereas ted was almost a little threatened by it or you know or very threatened by it really and so so it was fun to write that contrast but monty you're right he's also has his demons from his past and that for me is um what makes characters, especially in, in crime fiction, um, interesting. And there, um, I don't know, have, have many, have, have you guys read very much of Michael Connelly? He's the, the Harry Bosch, the writer that wrote the Harry Bosch series. He still writes the, the series and it's, I think on net, I mean, is it Netflix or? I think it's Netflix, you know. Netflix, anyway. Um, so Michael Connolly has a quote about, uh, y'all, I always butcher quotes, but it's something to the effect of, what's interesting is not how the detective works the case, it's how the case works the detective mm -hmm. that's interesting. And I've always kind of taken that to heart. And so when, when I wrote Monty, as well as Ted, I, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't hear that quote until I, after I would, after I had published a couple of books, but I intuitively, ha, instinctively had that in mind. And then when he said that at a conference that I was at, I was like, exactly, that's exactly true. And that's, I think what I was doing instinctively is knowing that whatever cases that would come up for my protagonist needed to 
do some kind of a number on my characters. Needed to bring stuff up for them. Super interesting. Well, time is flying, and before we get too near the end, I want to. Uh, Christine um, has uh, offered the way we have to do a virtual book club. You know, if we were all in person, we'd all have our books and we'd sit around with Christine and she would sign them for us. But since you already have your books, and then we have Christine hostage here in her home in Whitefish, she has graciously agreed to sign book plates for anybody who would like a book plate. So um, you can use the chat feature to. Uh, let us know how you would like that inscribed and Emily will work with Christine and we'll get those um, signed and sent out to you so that you can put those uh, in your book. Thank you, Christine, for agreeing to do that. It's really, absolutely, um, really very meaningful for us and it's a, it's a really neat um, uh, addition to, uh, to, to our process. So feel free to use the chat. If you forget to use the chat, just email Emily or Jill or myself um, in the next day or two and we'll uh, we'll make that happen. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that it's really interesting, the, the character development issue, because I going back to, to Ed's point of, about kind of, you know, some of the some of the disenfranchised, you don't, you, you don't skimp on on developing those characters either. I mean, that, and that's the other part is a lot of writers, you just have standard criminal, standard drug addict, standard wife beater. But here you give those people um, humanity, I guess is what I'll say. And for me, that's a very special thing. Do you do that intentionally? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's something I do instinctively. Yeah, um, good answer. I, and because of who I am and how I see the world and how I see my fellow human being. And there's a, for me, you know, it, without getting too philosophical, I mean, I feel like most people are not just born bad apples, you know? I mean, I, I, I played with that in the wild inside a little bit, this idea that, you know, that, are there just evil people that are just, you know, born that way? Or, you know, is, or are there things that happen in everyone's lives that make it so that they snap, you know, or do something horrible, or they've never been shown anything different, or they've been abused so much that they end up doing the same thing because that's all they know. And, um, or, or they're so down and out that they have no choice but to rob a store or, you, you know, so that, I think it's just the way I, th I think, you know, and feel about my fellow human that most people that commit crimes are probably products of some really unfortunate circumstances. And that's not to say that there aren't some pretty scary people out there. And then that there aren't some, you know, wicked. That's not to say that there isn't some wicked. I don't know. What do you guys think? It's a pretty philosophical question. No I think one of the themes of the of your books is the power of the past, the power of significant events. In some cases, like the episode with his father. Uh, for Ted, and I think that that just, that persists through a, a lot of the plot lines that s what happens in the past doesn't stay in the past. It remains and affects right. what's happening later with the individuals. Yes, and I think that's true of the side characters, too. I mean, I might not develop it right. to that point, but there's this feeling that it's not just the my protagonists that are dealing with it. it's the obviously the side characters have this all the stuff that humanizes them as well sure yeah so and then that part of it might be you know when i'm developing them and thinking about them i mean some of it's intentional i mean it's a mixture i guess of of intention and instinct to do, to do that with my characters but yeah thank you mary that's spot on 
So connect two connected questions. What do you read for fun? And when you're not writing, which we hope you're always writing because we can't wait to read the next thing you come up with, um, what, what do you do? Well, um, so are you asking me what I read or what, what I do when I'm not reading? What, what, you, what, you, what you read when, for fun and what you do when you're not okay. reading or writing. Okay. Um, so for reading, I am often reading a lot of murder mysteries, not just because I write them and I love the genre, um, but because this is something I didn't anticipate, but when I became an author and got in more and more involved in that world of mystery authors, you know, before COVID, there was all sorts of conferences that I was at and other bookstore events where there might be a couple of us authors together and we would do panel discussions and we would have to read each other's books. And at conferences, I was often on panels where I would have to read other people's books. And, and then sometimes you get asked to judge contests that have maybe, I mean, I was a judge for a contest last year that I had to read 350 books for. And it was, that's like a, you know, like a, more than a book a day <laughs> or a book a day. And I, you know, you, you can't do it physically. You, you can't do it but you you have to you know decide quickly is this you have to decide in the first chapter or two is this a content is this going to even get close to being a contender and so you weed a lot of stuff out but in the long run if there's a lot of good stuff you're still reading a lot of books and so um so that was all mystery all suspense when i that one year when i was reading but i do get tired of it it's like too much of a too much of a good thing or you know it's like having all candy or all you know it's like too many too much of one thing is not good so i try and vary my reading diet and now that i'm not judging a, a major contest this year i'm um i'm having fun still reading some mysteries but i'm reading a lot of other things too that that I, you know i i mean i i'm trying to catch up with some pulitzer prize novels that that are awesome. Um, I just read, oh, this one, The Great Believers, Re Rebecca Mackay, and um, quite good. And I, sometimes I read nonfiction, and um, I love Elizabeth Strout. Um, she's the Olive Kittredge, the author of Olive Kittredge. She's, I think she's a beautiful writer. And, um, you know, I, I just try and catch up on a lot of book club books that people, you know, all the light we cannot see and stuff like that, that sometimes I don't fit in when I'm in my busy, crazy author mode. And that's the, that's the one perk, the upside, if, you know, if there are upsides of this pandemic is that I've been able to catch up on other kinds of reading that I might not normally have time for when I'm under crazy deadlines and trying to make conferences and all that kind of thing that kind of thing and doing lots of traveling. I think we're all still trying to get over 350 books. Wow, yeah, that's, that's a lot I'm still trying to get over that too. In fact, yeah. I had to kind of put reading aside for a while because I was so burnt out on it after that year. And um, yeah, so this, so what do I like to do besides that, besides reading and, and writing? I, I love to hike and um, I didn't get into the park more than twice this year, but it was kind of crazy up there and with the east side closed. So I did more hiking around the Whitefish Range and up in the Eureka area and a little bit in the Swans. Um, and I, um, you know, that's, I walk my dogs, you know, there's, for me, there's like hiking, a real hike. And then there's walking the dogs. And the walking the dogs, I have two Labradoodles and I walk them daily. And sometimes, sorry if I'm, lo I'm looking out the window cause that's up where I walk, but um, which is out to my left. But I, I walk them because they're just crazy and they'll bug me if I don't walk them a lot. Anywhere from three, 
probably three to four, sometimes five miles a day. And so those are my like walks and other people might consider those hikes, but those are my walks. <laughs> my hikes are like, if I go hiking, that's, that's like a day. Like, you know, you pack your pack and you, and you take your food and your water and all that. With the dogs, I just, I, sometimes I don't even bring water. I just make sure I get out there and, and, and walk them. And so I do a ton of that. In better times, I used to play a lot of squash when I could get on a squash court, but I haven't done that, not just because of COVID, but also because my writing world, my author world got so crazy um, between, and I still, by the way, owned a Pilates studio for quite a while into my writing career after it started to take off after The Wild Inside was published. And so I was busy running my Pilates studio and doing that, but I've recently sold my Pilates studio and, and but I'm, I was still asked to teach Pilates in the studio. And that was part of this, the agreement when I sold it that I would continue to teach, which was great because I love to teach it. Um, but the pandemic put a little bit of, of a dent in that. So I haven't been doing much of that. Yeah. So Carolyn needs to know the names of your dogs. Okay, so I have a uh, blue. He's a my husband's actually taken them with him to give make sure it's quiet around here, um, and he because he barks a lot at deer and different things walking by, um, and he's a black labradoodle and he's his both of his this is way more information than you want but both of his parents are labradoodles and he's a little bit smaller and oh, maybe about 45 pounds. And the other one is named Guinness and his mom is a chocolate lab and his dad is a poodle. And the reason we have to do this is because my husband's got some allergies to, to dander with dogs and they're, they're a little less dander. And so Guinness is, he's brown because he's, you know, he's got a chocolate lab as a mom. And we thought he'd be about blue size. He's 85 pounds. So he got kind of big and, um, yeah, he's really cute though. <laughs> That's They're both really cute, but he's got a lot of energy and being 85 pounds, like I said, if I don't go out and walk them daily, it's a problem. Well, we're nearing the, the end of our time together. I, I can't believe it's gone so quickly, but I'm not surprised because we have one of the most engaging, talented um, writers around oh, with us so tonight. Sweet. <laughs> and um, it's just such a treat to have you. We talked a little bit earlier. There, there is writing going on, but there's nothing yet to announce. Um, yeah. But but you're you're not uh, you're not going to go the way of uh, Parker Lee on us, uh, uh, and uh, and and leave us just with the two remaining ones that are in a vault somewhere. No, <laughs> no. Good, good. Um, I don't. Well, I don't know. They're not, they're on a hard drive somewhere. And I honestly don't know if I could find them or recover them, which may not be a bad thing. Well, it's, it's good that they're on a hard drive. I was, my, my son um, uh, had a teacher, Anthony Mara, who is a writer and he has a couple of books out. And his process is that he writes the book, the first draft and turns it in and then he erases it and retypes it all over. You're kidding. Yeah. No, that sounds cool. wrong. Yeah. I couldn't do that. Well, um, one of the things I will say that I, um, w Christmas is coming up. Um, we're going to try and package all four books um, in some way, shape, or form. So keep your eye out for that. I think it makes the perfect Christmas prize, although they may never see the person you give it to for a month or two. So, um, so keep that in mind. And also, we talked a little bit, there's an anthology of short stories celebrating Montana open space that Christine has a has a story in um, called A Million Acres. Um, so that's that's also out there um, if you need a fix. Beautiful, it's a beautiful book, beautiful um, book. lots of great stories. Um, and the, the proceeds go to? Private Land, land Conservation, land, yeah. Land yeah. So um, Christine Carbo, thank you very much. Everybody, thanks for joining uh, with the book club. Again, uh, um, we'll do Wonder of Birds next, next month. And um, if you, didn't get your chat in to get your book plate, just email emily at glacier.org or doug at glacier.org um, and we'll get that taken care of for you. Um, thanks everybody, be safe. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Thank it, you. It is absolutely our pleasure and um, everybody have a great rest of your evening. Thank thanks you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.